And we are live. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to Everything is Attitude. Uh, welcome, Rosemary. Hi, Al. How are you? Doing well, doing well on this Friday uh, evening for us, yes? It's very cold and very windy here in Florida, I have to say. it's uh, It's been raining most of the day. Uh, all of the people who live here full time are really excited about it because we don't get rain and wind very often. And so people think it's a bit of a relief. And then all the snowbirds are coming down saying, what's going on? Where's the sun? <laughs> so, so we talked a, a, a little bit about, uh, we always talk about topics before the show. And um, actually, can I, can I just talk about what uh, happened to introduce the topic and then you could do your I story? I just would love Al. First of all, let me say hi, everybody. And hi so, co host so, Al Pisano. And, uh, <laughs> and now, Al, over to you. All right. And then I'll throw it right back to you. So, uh, I, as everybody knows out there, I am, I am a parent, I am a father of, of three children. And uh, without getting into too much of the detail, uh, one of my children uh, today uh, was, was hurting because of. What seems like a minor thing, it's something that happened with his friend um, and probably in the scope of life is a minor thing. But to him, uh, it was it was a big deal. Um, and uh, this one particular child doesn't often show uh, his emotions and doesn't get upset too much. But this this upset him and, and uh, it was a big deal to him. And uh, I, I think what we talked about this show being about is uh, I felt I felt helpless in a way because he's in pain. And he's struggling, um, and as much as I could talk to him and hold him and and uh, try and work through it, he's still, in the end, feeling the pain of the situation. Um, and I think the theme that we really want to talk about is when you when you do want to help, uh, but you kind of feel helpless anyway, or uh, that decision you make whether to help or not. Right, Rosemary? It's a tough call. I remember when my daughter was little like your kids are i remember she was when i say little she was um she was 11 or 12 years old uh her father uh was a boxer he was a sort of a an amateur but but you know very well known in his in his field so and he was he was he was good at it so when as she was growing up we would teach her one or two little moves you know if anybody uh, hurts you, you know, you, this is where you punch them here, always on the jaw or uh, the nose. And so so you, you you sort of teach your kids, don't you, how to protect themselves a little bit. And I can remember uh, there was a, a, another girl at school who was, she was a known bully and, you know, so many kids were in awe of her because she, they're basically terrified of her. Uh, and um, she would pick on kids who were smaller and and often younger and so on and samantha was just a little thing she was a skinny little thing when she was when she was she's still a skinny little thing but she's but she was sort of looked very frail she was very shy she wouldn't say boo to a goose she was really quiet and shy and one day she came home from school and uh, it reminds me because you're telling me this story about your son one day she came home from school and she's very fair skinned and I, I looked at her and I, I did a double take. She's got these little bruises all over her face, her neck. And then I checked her out. She got bruises on her arms. And, and I'm saying to her, what happened to you? They just were small bruises. But nevertheless, they were, they were you know, blue bruises, really prominent bruises. I said, what on earth happened to you? And so she said, you know, so, well, I came out of class and all the kids are streaming out of class. And she said, I felt myself being dragged by the arm by someone. And this girl, I won't mention the name, but this girl started punching me and punching me because another girl had said that Samantha had said something about her or something, you know, which, which was actually turned out not to be true. But anyway, um, and this kid started punching her and punching her and it, and I, I looked at her and said, well, you know, well, what happened? Did she hurt you? And so she said, well, she kept punching and punching. And Samantha was a so very passive, quiet little thing. And all the kids around were cheering because there's a fight going on, you know, with two girls. That's, you know, that sort of thing. You see, you see it on telly in the movies all the time. 
And uh, so, uh, you know, so she's, so uh, I said, well, what happened? So she's, well, she kept punching and punching and I kept trying to tell her, you know, please stop, please stop. And then she hurt me. And the way she said it was, and then she hurt me. And I said, and then what? So she said, I put, punched her on the nose and blood spurred. <laughs> she started crying. She said, blood spurted everywhere. And she started crying. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's like, you know, good, good girl. I'm thinking, good girl. <laughs> of course, you never want a fight or an argument to get that far. Of course you don't. But uh, teaching your children to defend themselves, I think, is, you know, sort of without being bullying and without hurting and harming but teaching them to defend themselves and teaching them how to deal with emotional traumas because you you said your son uh it, it doesn't sound like a big thing i think that's the first thing you said when you you started talking about it it's not such a big thing but actually it as is a parent it's a big thing for us because we do, we hurt when our children hurt yeah but it's a big thing for the child as well at that in that moment and and Correct. what do we do how do we how do we teach them to defend themselves how do we teach people to help themselves and often people grow up not knowing how to defend themselves they grow up not knowing uh what you know whether they should say something or do something uh, it's it's a difficult situation. So what happened then, Al, in the, at the end of this scenario? Or probably it isn't the end of the scenario. No, it's not really. I mean, I I, I um, you know asked him you know what was going on and uh, what he was doing, and it wasn't anything in particular. I think uh, they used to be attached to the hip, and I think uh, this particular friend is now not so attached to the hip and kind of avoiding him a little bit. Uh -huh. So I think it's. Just he's very sensitive too, so um, I think that's a big, big piece of it. And I asked him if he spoke to him about it, and he said no. Uh, so you know, I, th I, th I think um, in the end, I said uh, to him, "There's not much that could be done if if this boy doesn't want to be your friend, and uh, if if this uh, boy is making decisions uh, that." are not compromising decisions of friendship and, and, and wanting to do things with you and including you, uh, you're better off knowing now. And I said to him, I know that doesn't help and you're still hurting about it. Um, uh, but uh, he does have another friend that's very close to him. And I said, you have friends that are close to you and uh, focus your attention on, on, on that friend that, that wants to be with you and wants to be around you. And, so and what you were doing was you were, you were talking to him, but you were also listening to him as well. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's a huge thing. Listening is a, a huge thing. But I think we shouldn't make light of, you know, when our children are hurting. Uh, I was actually talking to someone this morning, and again, I can't tell you who it is, but he, this this man has two sons. One is six and one is ten. And uh, um, we we know a mutual person, not, not a friend of mine, but he's a friend of this other guy. We know this person. I had to go to him a few months ago uh, in a professional capacity as a doctor, this other guy. So this person I'm talking to said, well, how did you find him? And I said, well he was fine and he looked at me raised a brow and I said all right well he has lousy bedside manner and uh, I said he didn't make me feel comfortable which is very difficult because when you're sick and you go to see a doctor you want them to at least look you in the eye and listen to you or, or appear to be listening to you and uh, he said uh, so I said well my impression is that he's a very moody person and so he, he, he laughed and he said, you, you've got it exactly right. He is a really moody person. It depends on which day you catch him, whether he's friendly or whether he's not friendly. Now, I have to tell you that I cannot deal with people like that. I just, because you just don't ever, you're always on edge around them. You never quite know how they're going to be on any given day. So I was laughing at him. Uh, this guy, we were laughing together about this story. And this guy said, well, I have a rule in my house, no whining. Okay, well, you know, be careful because no whining might mean you're not listening to the 
child if he's got an issue or a problem. Be right. careful with that. I do understand why there's the rule. But in my house, we had a rule. I don't know if you know this, Alan, if I've ever told you this. And we still have this rule today. Uh, the rule in my house has always been no sulking. You right. cannot sulk. Which is different, but, right? Then... But it's very different. It is very different. And he says, oh, I'm going to use that. And I said, well, wait a minute. You can't, you know, when... I can remember Samantha having a boyfriend. He was a lovely, lovely guy. I do wish she'd have married him, but she didn't. But then, that's a whole other thing. But he was lovely. He was sort of probably my favorite of all the boyfriends she ever had. Uh, but he was a sulker. And I can remember one time that had some sort of an argument going on. And it was a Saturday night and we were staying in. We'd had dinner. We decided to watch a movie and he's sitting on the sofa and he was not happy about something or another. And he was sitting on the sofa sulking. And I just looked at him and I said, Pete, I'm going to say this to you. I don't want to have to say it again. We have a rule in this house, as you know, no sulking. So you put a smile on your face. We're going to all enjoy the movie or you have to leave. <laughs> so he looked at me. Nobody had ever called him out on it before. Nobody. And uh, I said it nicely. I didn't say it aggressively, but right. no sulking is the rule. And he was so taken aback for a minute, and then he just grinned at me, and he sort of sheepishly grinned and said, I'm sorry. And, and that was it, and it was <laughs> done with. Uh, if you've got something you want to say to someone, find a way to say it to them in a way that is nice, that in a way that is kind, in a way that is acceptable. Uh, so many people allow things to go on and on and on and build up and build up and build up until all of a sudden then you blow and then there's this aggressiveness that goes on. I always yeah. like to feel that you should nip something in the bud. When it's happening, say something, you know? Do you understand? My, what yeah, my, yeah um, my, my son was, uh, I first realized he was upset he uh, he was getting upset. And he was kind of covering his face, and he he said, "I just I just want to be alone." And I said, "I said, well, you well you could be alone with me sitting next to you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and eventually he opened up. Um, but had had I walked out, he would have been alone, and 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 it would have gotten worse. And it would have, yeah, it would have made things much much worse. We've got Mary Lou here with us. I don't know if any time at all you feel like you want to interject here, Mary Lou. Hello, no. She says she's, she don't want to be on camera today. She's a bit windswept, but that's all right. We can we uh, can hear uh, her well though. Pardon? We can still hear her. Yes. Yeah, so if you want to interject, by all means, feel free to say something because she's got two kids as well, and one of them is a sulker, right, Mary Lou? I'm not saying <laughs> she's not going to say. It, sorry, I don't want to. I don't want to put her in a in a difficult position. But at times, yes, he is at times. You know, a little bit on the moody side. But you know, but but I think that I think it's very important to not allow your kids to go off and have that sulking time. I think it's you know, even though it's difficult sometimes. And the thing is. If they go off on their own, they'll think that that's what they can do. And then as they get to be adults, they can go off on their own as well. Right. And what happens then is that nobody really knows what's going on with them. Everybody gets confused. Their partner, their mate, or for whoever it is, thinks, is it something I did? And it just creates, you know, we're all about communicating, aren't we? It, yeah. it creates this, um, this uh, inability for people to communicate properly. And I think that, you know, when you see something like this going on with your kids, I think it's really important to teach them. Of course, we teach them by our example. So if you're moody and you go off sulking or you're an aggressive person and you shout, and your kids are going to do the same thing. But, you know, so we have to teach by example. But I think it really is important to not allow your kids to go off, especially how old is... is uh, Justin, he's he is divorced. just turned thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. So, you know, you don't, you can't allow a kid to, you know, go off and have that sulking time. It's, it's you know, you sit down with them. You, you know, you you so even if, as you've said, you can be alone with me in the room. Exactly. You know, but <laughs> stay there. You know, stay there and let them know that whenever they're ready. Exactly. You know, 
you can and, they can talk to you and they can open up to you and i think you did you know that sounds to me like you did exactly the right thing there and, it, and it's something you were you were you shared a story earlier which i would love to hear but um not just with our I, kids with 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 any or you were about to share a story before we went <laughs> on the air uh because uh, i think the the easy way out even you know with your kids is when when you're confused or when they're hurting or when somebody's angry um, or in pain, it's easy to just let it go because then you don't have to put yourself out there. You don't have to be vulnerable. You don't have to worry about uh, anything but your own self. So it's easy to just step away and say, hey, let them be alone or hey, they're, they're not doing well. I don't want to bother them. That's the easy way out, right? Yeah, well... I'm not sure it's the easy way out because I think sometimes people have a hard time walking away because then there's attached to that walking away or pretending you can't see a person if you know they're in trouble, that sort of thing. Along with that comes a lot of guilt and a lot of, you know, yeah. and, and oh, I wish I, I wish I could have done something. So it might seem at the moment the easy way to turn your, to, you know, to, to, to sort of, you know, so I'm thinking of the story of, of uh, you know, Jesus and the, you know, and the Good Samaritan, you know, all these people walk by him, he's laid in the street, all these people walk by the, you know, the crippled guy, and then, you know, and then one person steps forward. Not that I'm saying, again, be safe, we're, we're all about yes, be safe, yes. But um, I, it happens to me, uh, I've been saddened so many times, so so many times because as as uh, most people know i am a healer i ran a healing organization for more than 30 years i'm not really that old you know i'm just <laughs> <I'm> kidding <laughs> um i ran a healing organization i ran a healing organization in the uk which was was you know i ran for more than 30 years and and i also had this well the equivalent in the states for quite a few years as well and the amount of patients who would come to me, one particular person, one uh, lovely woman came to me. When she came to me, she'd had cancer for several years, but it was getting progressively worse. And um, when she came to me, I put the first thing I did was put my arm around her and took her into the healing room and explaining what I was going to do and how I was going to give her healing and so on. And uh, she told me later that it was the first time anybody had put their arm around her in such a long time because people are afraid. Um, and how upset she was because she'd be walking down the street doing a shopping and she'd see friends from years ago who would cross the street rather than meet her face up because... And it's not that they don't care, it's because people are afraid. It's, it's, it's almost as if when somebody is sick or hurting or going through a divorce or, or you know, mm -hmm. been involved in an accident, whatever it is, uh, it's almost as if people see that, they see that person as very vulnerable and it reminds us that how vulnerable as human beings we are and it's easier for people to turn away than it is to, you know, to sort of go up to someone, put your arms around them or just or even just go up and say, how are you doing? That reminder of our humanness, that reminder of our vulnerability, that reminder that this can happen to you, because in a heartbeat, in the blink of an eye, our lives can change. Uh, we can go from being very healthy to not, to either dead or crippled or whatever. Uh, in in the blink of an eye, in the blink of an eye, it can happen. And that's why it's such a shame that people have such a hard time communicating. People, you know, people hold hold grudges. I know Mary Lou wants to say something in here. Dive in, Mary Lou. Just really have a minute. I mean, Go. I don't want to dive in. Dive in. I was that's what we're about. When you were just talking about that and, you know, people walking around and not coming to you to maybe comfort you or listen to you. And some, when, I, when you mentioned about divorce, when I went through my divorce, and it was a very difficult time, and it went on for quite a while as far as the, you know, settling things. 
And I remember that someone that I thought who was very understanding and a friend, when it was finally through, done, said to me, well, then now you have nothing to complain about. And I've <laughs> never forgotten what they said. And I think of it a lot. And it actually makes me personally clam up more if I know that you don't believe that. <laughs> I don't. Know. What you really, what you really, I think what you mean is you clam up about okay. about uh, the things that are hurting or upsetting you. Emo emotion, emotional things, yes. Right. Yeah, because yeah. I remember that they felt that I was, I maybe, complaining too much. And well, sometimes, but sometimes you just need someone to talk to and and someone to vent to. Somebody I had this 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 week when a, a person I know who comes here every day needed to vent. And I just said, you need to sit down and just, you know, tell me what's going on. We we need you. Know, sometimes we do, we need to vent. It's true, but but so many people, and especially the people who have never been through something, you know, heartbreaking, whether it's divorce or whether it's cancer or whether it's you know anything else at all. Uh, there is this. It's a there's a fear factor that goes along with it, and people. I honestly think it's not so much that people are um, are unconcerned or insensitive. Some some are, of course. That friend is totally. But uh, I think it's that you know we we we're afraid. We're afraid to face yeah. someone who we know is dying. We don't know what to say to them. And the silly thing is that. And so here is your recipe in one for this week. You don't have to say anything. You just have to be present. Right. Just be present. Uh, as you said yeah. with uh, with Justin, so yeah. we're coming full circle here, you can be on your own even if I'm in the same room with you, but be right. present, you know, and uh, you don't have to say all the right words. You don't have to make all the right actions. You just say how you how are you doing and uh or you just say hey i've just come to sit with you whatever it is the that, rosemary that that came up with jeff too a couple times ago too right he said sometimes all he needed was just people to, to be right they didn't have to say anything or they couldn't say anything that would have made him feel better uh, but just them being there helped sometimes well so often there's nothing to say right. right there's nothing to say you don't need to say anything there's nothing to say there's nothing at all that you have to say. Right, but that comfort of having somebody there. But that's just, uh, you know, sort of this feeling helpless thing that we're talking about with people not knowing what to do and being afraid to approach, and especially because it does remind us we are human beings and we are very, very vulnerable. I'm sitting here with you talking now, but... but I hope it's not going to happen, but within a blink of an eye, I could drop dead. I mean, people do that all the time. Life is precious, so let's make the most of it. Don't be afraid of your vulnerability. Embrace it and understand, yes, it can happen to me too, but if it does happen to you, what would you like people? To, how would you like people to behave towards you? You would like someone at least to be present because there is no lonelier place than being sick and feeling that everybody has deserted you. Yeah, no. Ex except I'm going to reverse it because another really lonely place is, especially for parents who have a child who's sick, and I've had this happen this week as well. <laughs> what can we do? That's your dog going on there. We can, what can we do? Yeah, yeah. People feel so helpless. They have to sit and watch someone they love sick they have to sit and watch someone they love dying and the helplessness and the loneliness of that is terrible and of course as a healer I see it all the time I mean going to homes and hospitals where people do not know what to do and I try my very best when I go to see patients I try my very best to involve the family because the family, you know, as a healer, it's not just the person who's sick who needs healing, it's the family who needs healing. And I try to bring people together and I always give the people who are visiting, the parents or the loved ones, I always give them a job to do. 
because the worst thing is to sit next to someone who's really sick, possibly dying, and you don't know what to do and you feel completely helpless. I always give them a job to do. That job can be as simple as just sit and hold somebody's hand. Read to them, even though they might be in a coma or might not seem to be listening to you. Tell them a story. Be present and let them know that you are present. So I always give them a job to do. And I always, with my the families of my patients, I always teach them how to give healing. So they have a job to do because there's nothing worse when you have someone who you love and you have to watch them going downhill. You have to watch them possibly dying or whatever it is that's going on with them. There's nothing worse than feeling completely helpless. So I make sure I give them a job to do and I teach them how to give healing. It takes me five minutes to show them and it takes them five minutes to do it. But they can sit there for the five minutes or they can sit there for the half an hour and I teach them how to, you know, sort of bring that energy through themselves, that God energy, that God force through themselves and then hold somebody's hand or put your hands on them and visualize the energy flowing from you to them. You don't have to, you know, don't be aggressive about it. Be gentle and easy and it doesn't have to be, you know, something intense by, you know, by any means. In fact, it shouldn't be intense. But be present and find yourself a job to do or if you're with someone who feels helpless, give them a job to do. You know, make them feel that they're, it's important for them to be there. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of comments too. And I, I was actually thinking as you were talking about, you know, when my father died, he, he, uh, we found out he had cancer. And within five weeks, he had passed, he passed away. Um, and tons of people came to visit him. But there were definitely people that were very close to him that did not. Um, and they, we saw them afterwards at the funeral and at the wake. Um, and, and they, a few of them said, I, 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 I couldn't see him that way. I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to come. Um, most did come. So Nettie, Nettie actually has a comment in, in reference to that. Uh, she said, uh, uh, sometimes I wonder if it's too scary to face exactly that happened to me. When for the life of me, I couldn't see my friend who was dying. I just couldn't. She ended up dying and I feel very bad, but I pray and think of her often. I wish I could have done better. Um, so I think, well, I think I have a comment back to Nettie. I wish Nettie that you could have done better too, because the as you said earlier, Al, it's sometimes it's easier for people to, or it feels easier for them to not be involved. But then it isn't easier because then you've got the guilt and you've got all the wishing. Then the I wish I'd have done differently. I hope so. You can't do anything, netty, about the you know what happened to you and what you did do. But what you can do is learn from it, and the next time it happens to you, keeping my fingers crossed, the next time it happens to you, uh, this is going to sound really harsh, uh, and I don't mean it to by any means. And I am not judging netty, and I'm not judging anyone else for this. It isn't easy for me to walk into a hospital. I can tell you when I you know I was I had all my kidney stuff, and I was in in and out of hospital for months and months and you know two years later still there in and out uh and um you know and then i had several miscarriages and then i did i had to go through all of that stuff and the last place i wanted to be was in a hospital and the last thing i ever wanted to do was be a healer let me tell you that when gray eagle said to me you know this is what I want you to do. There's no, no way. Because I find, even now, I find it extremely hard to be around people who are sick. But if I put my feelings to one side, I will walk into that hospital and I'll deal with that person because my main focus is what can I do for them, not how can I pretend that this isn't happening or how can I shy away from it it is painful to go and see especially when you love someone uh, Samantha was sick in hospital uh, a while ago she was bandaged her head she got pipes running everywhere and you know and I sat there and I held her hand 
And strangely, you would think I'd be praying a lot, but strangely, I didn't pray at that time because I just had, I just had to be in my faith in that moment uh, and to trust in that moment that whatever was going to happen would be the right thing. Now, when I got out of the hospital room and stood by the elevators, my knees just went and I just collapsed, as people do. You hear it all the time. But in those moments when you are needed, if you can find the courage, and I always believe that when I walk into a hospital or walk into a sick room, I'm not walking in there by myself. Yes, I've got Grey Eagle, but I also have God, and I have that God force with me. So when people are thinking those things, try netting them, you know, you can't do anything about that. There's no point beating yourself over the head about it because it's, you know, it's, it's a waste of time and energy, and uh, everything is attitude, so be positive, learn from it, and hopefully when you learn from it and you listen to what I'm saying to you, and I, I don't mean to offend, so I'm hoping I'm not offending, uh, but, you know, you, you, you have to have an attitude which is not about how you're feeling and how devastated you are. Facing someone in the hospital... Uh, comes from the love you feel from that person and that love will sustain you and even if you don't believe in God believe in love and that love will walk with you into that room and that love will stand by your side you will never be alone as long as you've got that love and you allow yourself to express that love I think oh, yeah, and, and, again, Mary, Lou. Mary Lou agrees with that right oh, I, yeah I think that's excellent and it's true because you do have to think of those people who are ill because that may be the only thing they want. That happened to my mom. The only thing she wanted was to see one family member who'd never came to see her before she died. And every day she asked, where was he? Where was he? And was he too afraid to come? I never found out. I never knew why. And he didn't show up. I don't know. I, I know this happens in families all the time. People say, I can't see him like that. Well, it's not about what you can't see. It's not about what you want in those instances. And remember this, if you don't brave it, uh, and that's what it takes sometimes, it takes a great deal of courage, but if you don't brave it, you will live with the consequences for the rest of your life. And, uh, you know, then that's that's not a place you want to be in. So we, have, we have a couple other comments as well. Um uh, Chris said, my top two feelings alone uh, situations, my top two feeling alone situations, wanting wanting to help and not being allowed and feeling alone in the midst of the crowd. Uh, so if you, I guess if uh, she's experienced the desire to help but not being able to, something stopping her from doing so. Uh, that's easy. That's an easy remedy. And Chris is a student of mine, so she should know better. There is always something you can do. Whether someone allows you through the door, you know, if somebody blocks you, if somebody says, no, I don't want visitors. If, I mean, I had a patient whose husband banned everybody from the hospital. There are things you can do. If you believe in energy, if you believe in the power of thought and the power of the thought energy, there's always something you can do whether you believe in the power of thought or not actually you can sit down you can pray you can go into a church or you can sit in your armchair you can kneel by the bed whatever you do to make those prayers if you're a healer you can send healing energy and healing prayers on a daily basis remember you only need to spend 10 minutes in every day to do it you don't have to again you don't have to be intense about it but do what it is that you can do and be content that you are doing the best that you can do. If someone will not allow you in to see, as in my case, a patient, it was I only ever had that happen to me once. Uh, and that had nothing to do with them stopping me from going to see the patient for the patient's benefit. It had to do with the family being very jealous of anybody else you know coming in they didn't think about the patient they only thought about themselves and what they wanted in that particular case i actually turned up at the end of the day anyway i thought i'm not, <laughs> not going to let this happen, going to happen right? only because i was getting reports from people 
at how lonely and upset and when I went in there, thank goodness that I did do that. You know, sometimes you just have to take the bull by the horns and, and go and do something. But if you can't do that or you're not allowed in, there is always something that you can do. Remember, everything is attitude. There is always something you can do. And again, the recipe is do not feel helpless because you are not. We are never helpless in any situation. We might feel it. We might feel desperate about it. We might feel, you know, irritated or exhausted or what have you because things aren't happening the way we want them to. But all you have to do is to center yourself, be quiet by yourself, sit in a chair. Do you like this recipe? I'll sit in a chair, uh, close your eyes, visualize that God force around you, ask God for that, whatever it is, you know, God is only dog spelt backwards. I always tell this to people. Whatever it is that you believe in, and even if it's only that you believe in your own self and your own energy, extend that energy out and send it to that person. Send those loving and caring thoughts to that person you want to help. You need to, you know, you you, you never, ever need to be helpless. And I'm saying this as a person who has on many occasions felt desperately useless and helpless and so on but I don't know I, you know it's an odd thing I don't know where my faith came from I've no idea I certainly didn't grow up in a religious household I was never ever taught about God except from my church I mean I went there when I was two years old but that was only on Sundays and there were so many other things that happened around that would have actually made me lose faith it, it, you know there, there were so many um people in our neighborhood yeah. was just so awful and just mean and aggressive i mean i came from a very very uh poor neighborhood uh you know every other house had somebody who'd been to prison for something or another one time or another i mean i so i'm not quite sure where that faith came from uh, I know that my church encouraged it, uh, but it's something that it's I it's inside of me, and no matter what has happened to me, and I've been in some awful situations, I can tell you. But no matter what has happened to me, I've always been able to hold on to that faith. And if you out there are listening and you're struggling to hold on to your faith, I know what it's like to struggle to hold on to it. So if you're struggling to hold on to it, just bear in mind, you are not helpless. You've, you've got your mind. You've got your thoughts. Even people who are in prison, even the people who have been captured, you know, your captor can beat you physically. They can starve you. They can do all sorts of things. But nobody can control your mind. Nobody can get in there. You know, that's for you. And that's where our, our faith comes. That's where our strength comes. And that's where our ability to, to be able to do something. Always to do something. That's where that comes from. Um, are there any other comments, Al? Or do you have a comment about yeah, that? Yeah, there are. Actually, Sharon, Feel free to dive in, Mary. She's Sharon, Sharon uh, says, uh, and you mentioned this a little bit uh, when, you, when addressing what Chris mentioned, uh, the flip side is doing everything you can, but after the person dies, you question whether you did enough. Um, and uh, Margaret says, the worst is sitting over your daughter. I did the same, Rosemary, but I also wished I were like my mother, who was the world's greatest nurse and knew what to do. A lot of time uh, she would say it is in God's hands uh, and, that, and whoever is ill's hands. <clears throat> and um, Margaret... Let me just say to Margaret, here is the only thing that you need to do. And if you can do this, it's more than enough. A lot of people can't do it because they're the other side of the world. But you can still do it in a visual sense. You can still do it, you know, you can you can think it. And if you think it, then it becomes, if you, if you understand... If you can hold someone's hand, you don't have to say a word, just hold someone's hand in gentleness, in, in love, and if you can do that, that's a gift to you. It's a gift to that person, but it's a real gift to you too. And that is all you need to do. You know, it really is. You can't 
you know, if someone is meant to to uh, to pass, someone is meant to suffer. We're we just remember we're just little human beings, aren't we? That's all we are. I always say to people, I'm just remember I'm a little human being. That's all I am, and you know, and that's all I can be. But my mind, my energy can be as much as I want it to be. So you know, there's you, you're not helpless. I never second guess. If you were there for that person and you held that person's hand or you had a kind word to say for that person, you don't need to do anything other than that. That's all you need to do. Yes. Just, and, like, you were there, just like you were there for your son. Same thing. Yeah. And even, you know, if I go back to my dad, you know, you know often it was just a matter of, you know, uh, towards the end, he was so tired and exhausted, but his, we just we were there uh, sitting with him, and every once in a while, he would open his eyes and see everybody in the room, and he would he, we would light up a little bit. And I think I think that's it, and and it's and it's almost um, it has an exponential effect too. If if the more people that do that, and the more people that come in, you know, all that energy builds and yeah, yeah. exponentially builds, and and helps whoever it is who's, without who's doubt. stick. Without a doubt. In, it, it, Know, because it's a question of building up the energy and the love and you know i i can remember um uh, a patient of mine who had lou gehrig's disease and uh, i don't know if you know about lou gehrig's but basically he was paralyzed he could make sounds but not he could really couldn't really understand uh what he was saying but his his he was so fortunate. He had three brothers. They came with their wives, and uh, and uh, the one person he felt was really really important for him to be there for him was me, and it was such an honor for me. Uh, but I was the one who you know everybody's sitting around. Nobody knows what to do in those situations. You go into a hospital, you see the family sitting around, and it's gloomy, and it's you know and people don't you know should we should what should we should we talk shouldn't we talk for goodness sake this is what i do with all of my patients and their families and i i mean you know i'm invited to these things people want me to be there because we have fun even when someone is laid in bed and they're dying and they're on practice that's not quite last breath but i take them down memory lane I give them something to talk about, but I'm also being constructive. So I'll say to the brothers in this case, you know, so what did you used to do when you were boys all together? What, was, what were your favorite things to do? And it might be fishing or it might be, you know, bike riding or whatever it is. And once one person starts, another person starts, then you start, then, of course, a lot of these memories are humorous. Or do you remember when he fell off his bike and broke his leg? Or do you remember when he jumped out of the apple tree and, you know, so, and so on? And we laugh and we have fun. I, I was in a hospital with a, with a wonderful, wonderful friend of mine, wonderful friend of mine, and he was in a, a coma at this point. And all his family were around, his wife, his wife's brothers, his brothers, all the family were around. And the nurses actually came in at one point. The, the, door, the door was closed, the curtains were around, and the nurse peeped, nurses peeked in. Is everything all right in here? Because we were laughing so hard, because we were going down memory lane. Now, that man was in his bed. He was in a coma. You think he couldn't hear? Yes, he can hear. And what is going to be the one type of energy that makes him feel good? It's loving and laughter and caring you know i remember i was in canada a few years ago and i did a, a huge event there were several thousand people and there were a lot of people there suffering in people in pain when you come to see me we laugh i'm very funny on stage we i sort of tell jokes and i just have lots of fun and laughter is would you say that's right mary lou that's al you you've been there with me we laugh and we cry. My audience cries a lot and we <laughs> laugh a lot. And I had a letter from a lady who was so upset with me. She said, how could you laugh when there are so many people there in pain? And I, I shook my head. I felt so sorry for this lady because, because she didn't get it. 
Love, maybe love, people love. out there, maybe people out there listening won't get it. But my love. thought was, when you're in such despair, and when you're in such pain, and you're surrounded by people who are in such pain, how can you not make it lighter? Why would you not make it lighter? La laughter is is the antidote for pain, right? To completely and utterly. So, and so my thought was, well, I felt very sad for her. How could you not laugh? amidst so much oppressive pain it could have been oppressive but people who lost their children were laughing people who thought they would never laugh again were laughing doesn't take the pain away completely but the relief and that moment of release of emotion and the relief is such a healing thing so as a healer how can i not smile and make people laugh and again everything al is attitude attitude everything is attitude so bringing laughter bringing sunshine into people's lives is very important if you can do that do we have any other comments going yeah, on? Well, close to time but um a couple more comments we have uh, uh sharon uh says and you mentioned uh someone in a coma and they could still hear you she said a few hours before my husband Died. He was slightly out of his coma. I asked him if he knew I was there, and he shook his head yes. I told him I love him and will miss him, but every day I honor his memory. Oh, Sharon, thank you so much for sharing that with us. That's a really, and you obviously have a great attitude uh, about these things. But yes, people that you know, they say that the last thing to go is our hearing, uh, and it's very true. And because I talk to people who have passed, they will often recount what was said, the conversations that were said uh, when when people thought they couldn't hear, uh, you know. So be very careful. Don't, don't, you know, all those families you have, all those issues, don't fight with each other standing over the over somebody's deathbed. Don't, you know, don't argue or be mean because that person will hear you. So, you know, the, the last thing to go is the hearing and people in the spirit world will often recount, oh gosh, they had a really... You know, they this said this or this, or they'll recount exactly what some loving person said to them the last words. And I'll often have people say, you know, was it the hospital? Did he hear what I said to him? And then someone in the spirit world will actually recount what was said to them. So, you know, it's very important and, and Sharon's right. And I'm glad her husband came out long enough to let her know that he knew that she was there. That's lovely. Yeah, Sharon says, yes, I try to have um, a good attitude. Chris says, laughter is the best medicine. Uh, Margaret, who, who says, I'm Maggie, um, she, she said, we did that with my mother and got the biggest laugh from her when I pointed at my sister-in-law and told her, whining, she got me drunk last night, and my sister-in-law replied, I don't see a broken arm. So they, they used laughter, too. Uh, yeah, I think it's, it's great. And anyone who's been you know, in a hospital situation or has been with people who are in pain, whether it's whatever it is, whether it's divorce, whether it's a breakup, whatever it is, people who have been around people in pain, uh, you know, we do, I know people think that I'm a miracle worker because I go in there and I seem to know just exactly what to say and do. But people don't see the other side where you, you, you're praying, hoping and praying that, uh, you know, you do the right thing or you say the right thing. I'm just as nervous as everybody, maybe not quite as nervous, but equally nervous in the beginning. But if you don't try it, you don't do it, then you, you don't learn. So get out there, have that positive attitude and know that no matter how much you're quaking in your boots, no matter how much you don't want to face someone being ravaged and uh, whatever else it is, whatever you imagine them to be is not going to be nearly you know, just, it, it, they're not going to be nearly as bad as what you imagine. So, you know, have that recipe of positive thinking, love, laughter. You are not helpless. None of us is helpless. There's always something you can do, even if it's just to simply quietly sit and pray, because that in itself is a very positive thing and it makes a difference. So I think we're out of time, Al. Yep, and, we uh, are. Um, Philip says one last thing. He says respect to uh, us and, and thank you. 
Uh, he enjoyed uh, what we talked about. So. Well, thank you for joining us, and thank you everybody out there for joining us. We always have fun at this, don't we, Al? I <laughs> think if we didn't get anyone listening, we'd still have fun, wouldn't we? We would. <laughs> Just enjoy this, you know, talking together and being together and so on. We hope to have a guest with us next week. We well, get to go to Christmas, though. Rosemary, just with that, um, a friend of ours we talked to possibly about being on the show. Uh, she is a, a cancer survivor and she's going through cancer again now. Um, and she uh, said today that from uh, when we had Christina on and we talked about the meditation and centering, uh, she does it every day because of that episode. So it's nice to hear um, that uh, people, uh, even if it's one person we help, right? Uh, it, it's, it's one extra person. Well, Grey Eagle always said to me, if you can reach one person, that's all you really need to reach. But I think we reach more than that. Yeah, well, thank too. you very much, Al. It's been a great show. If you out there would like to contact me, rosemary at rosemaryaltea.com. If you'd like to contact Al, it's al at alpisano.com, P-I-S-A-N-O. Right. If you want to uh, email us for this show, you'd like to come on as a guest, you've heard Mary Lou, she's been sitting here. You didn't have to be on camera, and you don't have to be in camera. Wherever in the world you are, you can you can just, you know, just we'll just use the microphone. Uh, and uh, if you want to know more about the show or you have something to share with us, um, info at everythingisattitude.com. I think Al, it just flashed up on the screen. So in the meantime... Al, thank you again. Thank you, Mary Lou, for your input. And until we see you again next week, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say. Please, please, please have a very, very, very blessed day. Thank you, everyone.